things based on the similarity of the data. Okay, so find groups or similar items. Now again, similarity or difference, it's a vague word. We are in format right now. We have to get a lot more formal about this. Yes, do you have a question? Uh, wouldn't that be classifying? So the, the difference between this and this is that these are predefined classification. Sick of diabetes or not sick of diabetes. Image has tigers, doesn't have tigers, right? Having a tiger is a very well specified uh, property. Uh, being spam, an email spam or not. This in here, I'm not, I'm not categorization, I'm not doing categorization based on well predefined labels. I'm finding groups of things that look the same. I don't know what they have. Bingu, did you start this? Yeah, I started. <coughs> but I'm not sure if uh, I did it. You have to right. check the focus to see the crisp text on the board. I think okay. I can. So is that, is that clear? In here, I may find a group, but I'm saying those few patients look the same, but I don't know what's up with them. They just look the same. I can't say they're sick or not sick. Maybe they all look the same because of some reason I don't know. Right. Same thing for web pages. I may group a bunch of web pages together and say those web pages are all similar, but I can't tell exactly a category or a tag for those pages. Right. Okay. Uh, before I move on, I want to I want to point out something that's not at all trivial. Uh, similarity is most of machine learning. If we know how to do similarity well, if we could tell if two objects are similar or not, two images or two emails or two patients or two web pages, we could solve any machine learning problem if we know what is similar and what is not. Similar all the classification problems, dimensional problems, clustering, or, or, or you know, it's, when I say groups, sometimes we call these clusters. All, all those problems can come down to understanding what items or objects are the same or similar versus what objects are not. If you know how to define a similarity that gives you this clear similar items versus non-similar items, that solves almost all machine learning problems. So this, this sounds easy, right? I mean, we, can we tell between two patients whether they're similar or not, or between two images? Should be reasonably easy, naively speaking. In fact, if you know how to do this, you can solve any machine learning problem. What's it? Sure. <coughs> Thank you, Bingu. Yeah. We'll figure out how to bring this camera. <laughs> It's not in there? Yeah. So you got a, a record. Just one second. Let's do this. Also called data points. I 
when, when we talk about learn from data, we have data here, we have data here, right? We have labels here, no labels here. But what are those objects? Those could be images, those could be text documents, those could be patients, those could be emails, those could be companies, people, or, you know, universities. It could be anything that I'm trying to classify or group together, right? Whatever my objective is. It could be, I don't know, pricing for tickets or, or movies or songs. Books. All these, uh, did you say web pages here? All these could be the objects I'm working with, right? If I have patients, maybe the labels are sick versus not sick or whatever it has. If I have people, <coughs> you know, uh, what the performance of the student is going to be or, or try to classify. Uh, what they're gonna do, or what kind of salary they have, or things like that. If they're movies, I may try to classify how the rating is gonna go, like how well the movie is gonna be received, or what, what kind of uh, audience it's appropriate for. If I have books, I may have different types. So depending on what my objects are, I'm gonna have, in label mode, some <coughs> appropriate labels. In unlabeled mode, of course, I don't have labels. I'm just trying to group things together. If I group songs together, it might be by the gender or the artist. So uh, we're going to have to handle these objects somehow. Right? Suppose I have movies. That's, everybody knows what a movie is, right? Humans think of movies very naturally. You watch something on the cinema, that's a movie. But computers don't have that sort of understanding. When I say movie, even if I spend the title of the movie or the year or the producer, the computer needs a handle for the old product. Same thing for patients. A doctor has an immediate natural understanding of what the patient is. A human coming to the door, they might be sick of something. Computers don't have that understanding. What's a human coming to the door? It needs a handle for those things. So whatever the objects are, computers need to have a representation in zero, one bits. Com that's the only thing computers understand, right? Something that's represented in a computer format. So before I can do anything, I have to take whatever objects I have, whether they're companies or people or web pages, and make them somehow representable for a computer to deal with. And that representation will be the representation that my algorithm for prediction or for clustering or whatever else I'm doing has to use. Right. So I'm going to need to transform these objects from a human perception objects. We know what the movie, what the song is, what the book is, so on and so forth into a very different numerical format so computers can understand those objects. But before we do that, let's keep going here. What else can we do? So we have those tasks of machine learning group, things together. We have classified things based on previous data. What other sort of machine learning is there? Yes. Uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning. <laughs> well, what is that? <coughs> Let's give him a chance first. Uh, we'll let the machine explore and then learn from the experiences it gets. Like if, 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 if it understands that it was correct that it learned from that step. If this step was not correct, then it learned that it was not correct. It won't take that step. So kind right. of That's correct, but a little vague. You have an alternative? Um, well, you, you, you would define a reward for the machine and let it... Define a what? Like a reward. A reward. But based mm -hmm. on what? So in here, the machine mm -hmm. or the algorithm has to design, predict, and label a category. In reinforcement learning, what is the machine task to do the basic task? Yes. Oh, it would require an active agent to provide a feedback, whether or. Now, the feedback or the reward is how you enforce 
something went well or not well, right? But what is the task of the machine? What is the machine gonna, it's not gonna predict the label, right, like sick. The machine is gonna try to decide or predict what? An action. An action. Determine, correct, action given a state. So given that, say, a game is in a particular configuration, I'm playing StarCraft, right? So I have my bases, I have these soldiers going around, flying, you know, killing, I'm mining minerals, or whatever it is in there. So I have the state of the game. What is the action me, the player, should do, given the state of the game, and given what I know about my opponents? You don't play StarCraft, maybe you play chess, right? Same thing, I have my chess board, I know where the pieces are, I know where my opponent pieces are, I, I know what I can do easily and what I can do hard, so I can maybe some, make some move ahead, a plan. What is the next action I should do on the chessboard? Monopoly, same thing, or whatever other game you want to choose. It's not just games. There's many other things that can be configured this way. So given a configuration or state of things, what is the best action I can take? Games are the most obvious example. Right? So the reason it's called reinforcement learning is because of those rewards or feedback. Machine will take to trade, will, will take uh, some action. Give whatever action it takes, it will get the feedback. Is it good or bad? The feedback may come later. Maybe the machine has to take three actions and then gets the feedback. But then it has to explore the space of possible actions. And it, if it does it hard enough with enough rewards, eventually it's gonna learn in that state, that action was better than this other action, right? If I try all possibilities enough times and for each, pos each action I get the reward or feedback, eventually I'm gonna know in this state that was better. Right? That's how people actually play games, right? Like poker, they try a few things and um, eventually you learn what worked well and what didn't work well. Uh, what else? Yes. Semi-supervised. Okay, semi-supervised learning is kind of a uh, one-two here, right? So what is it? Semi-supervised. It's not supervised, but it's not unsupervised. So what is it? Uh, unsupervised, but with uh, certain points where you give supervision. So I have some labels, but not all of them. And and presumably, so I have some labels. Uh, typically very few. Then labels may be expensive. There's some tasks, typically humans need to spend time to get labels, right? Like doctors have to look at patients. Uh, people have to look at their emails, so on and so forth, to get some labels. Some of these tasks are okay, reasonably easy, and some of these tasks are very hard and unnatural, as in the data doesn't come labeled naturally. You have to pay people to label the data, and that's expensive. So using few labels and a lot of data which is unlabeled, which we have plenty, unlabeled data it's easy to find. Go to any uh, you know, hospital or web pages or collection of images, finding tens of thousands of unlabeled images is easy, but spending money or you know, time to label them, that may be hard. So that's what it is. I, I wouldn't make a conceptual big deal about it, uh, but those are very different. What else in terms of machine learning? What other sort of machine learning is there? Something like forecasting. Like weather? Uh, time series data. Time series data. Data and forecast. Forecast <coughs> sounds the same like in here, right? Learn is learn to predict. Right? That's what we mean by learn. When we learn who has diabetes, it means how that be useful. When a patient comes in, we can forecast if that person has diabetes or not, right? It's kind of a prediction. This, it's also a prediction, but what's new is this time series. In here, we don't have static objects, like a patient, or like an image, or like a document. In here, 
uh, 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 actually a patient might be better described by a time series because a patient Virgil is not just a static object. If you look, you, a lot of doctors will look at the medical history. Medical history is a lot of tests or whatever happened to me since they have the history from, you know, 40 years ago. And then they can, that's a time series because at different times, the same exact patient had different symptoms, different diseases, different treatments, different medicines, so on and so forth. So what are the, some clear example of time series objects which are not static? I would say patients here, what else? Stop. Stock market. Web pages. Um, I guess it depends how you look at it, but in, in, in most of the information retrieval systems, say like Google, right? A web page, um, from the user point of view, it's mostly a static object is the page right now. It is true that the web page gets updated. And then when it gets updated, um, users have a, have a different information they get from it, servers act differently. Now I would say web pages in general are static. Things like a Wikipedia web page, you know, about Napoleon say. That web page might get changed, but it gets changed very rarely, right? I mean, rare enough, so it's not an evolution. It's not like a stock, like a stocks change their prices every five minutes, right? A uh, web page on Wikipedia might change, but it changes very slowly. But I would say some web pages may fit in these categories. So something that has a very, very live and active feed on it. Things like maybe CNN feed, right? That's something that changes and updates all the time. Your Facebook, you know, is if you have a thousand friends, every every two minutes something pops up on that wall, right? Uh, some um, so let's say Facebook news. Um, what else we have here? Some event management <coughs> in, a, in a, say an event of a hurricane or an earthquake. There's a live feed of all kinds of things that are happening. Right? So for web pages to be in this category for time series uh, domain are not the static ones, the ones that you know get published. Like even the course web page that I'm going to show you, that's mostly static because even if I change it you know, every three days, it's not something you have to monitor. Just next day you look at it. Right? It's in that sense, it's static. It's not a dynamic page that every two minutes or every 50, 30 seconds something happens. It doesn't need monitoring. What else? Movies. Hmm? Movies fall under the thing. Movies fall in here? Why? You mean the movie flows for two yeah. hours? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any task that tries to analyze things during the movie. If, if, if I have a machine learning task that tries to predict, you know, is this character gonna live or die? I think that becomes a time series problem. I have to pay attention to the evolution of that character during the movie. Most machine learning algorithms that I'm aware of, I'm not a movie expert, are looking at the movie as a whole, not as a, as a, okay, in the middle of the movie, how did it evolve from like the last half hour. But I guess for people that might be a thing, you know, and given what happened the last half hour or an hour in this movie, decide, for example, to quit watching or decide, you know, hey, this is not appropriate for my kids. I think something's gonna happen here, send them to sleep. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's typically how people think about movies. I think they think of them as a whole. Yes. But in movies, like how the audience react to the movie, for a director, that would be a useful thing. Right, but after the fact, right? After I've seen the whole movie. You mean the critical, like what people opinions have when they exit the cinema? Like okay, for a particular sense, now, like particular point in the movie, like. How the audience react to that? Right, right. So in that sense, exactly what he's saying, <coughs> if you are uh, the, the, you know, the director or, or the people in charge of how 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 to uh, manage the the people expectations during the movie and the downtimes, you know, sometimes they have this, for example, comic relief, right? There's a very serious movie, but there is a guy who always makes a joke, right? So I think 
they look at, again, I'm not a movie expert, but I imagine they look at this and say, hey, for an hour, we only have killings and bombs. Let's throw a comic relief in here. And joke. So in that sense, yes, I look at the evolution of the movie and decide where I should put a break or where I should do you know, something. right? But the machine learning tasks I'm aware about movies are trying more to analyze the whole movie and decide, you know, how people are gonna 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 react to this movie? They're gonna tell their friends to watch it or not? They're gonna like it? What kind of audience appropriate as a whole? Do we have more time, serious? Better data. Better data. Track a storm, for example. That's a, a live evolution. Okay, so we get that. Uh, what else? Is there any other machine learning? Then this, yes. I mean, you could treat language as a, uh, a sequence problem, and so Google, the way Google uh, predicts your next word, it tells you to trust to automatically what you should be typing next as far as words go. Right. So that <coughs> sequencing, I, I think, can be embedded into supervised learning um, in the sense that the op the only difference is, so he's talking about I'm typing something on the keyboard, right? You know, what, what's the next word? Or I'm typing something in Google, but like I start the query, you know, Northeastern University, Boston, sometimes there's a list of, you know, here's what you might be looking for. So what should be the object? If I apply supervision to that sort of things, what is my object? It's not a web page. Is it what? Prefix of a sentence? Something like that. Like if I if I show you the first few words in a sentence, the task would be what's the next word or what's the next word in search if I'm in a search box, right? So I think that you can be think of as a as a supervised machine learning, maybe. Or but the the, the object is more like the prefix of a sentence. Um, so if you're considering uh, predicting the next word as supervision, how is that different from predicting the next day's weather? from like supervision, how do you consider one, the time series that you consider? Right, good question. So conceptually, those might be the same. The problem is the space of those objects. We, we, we didn't get that far yet. Okay. We tried to get it there, but the prefix of a sentence, there are not that many prefixes, right? I may, I may be able to actually look at all sentences or most sentences or most type of sentences with most kind of prefix. So I can treat each prefix as its own thing. Weather patterns, or if you play a complex game like Go, you can try to play a game that way, right? For every possible situation so far, what do I do next? The problem with that approach is that the, mo the possibilities so far are so many that I can't really handle that space. How many weather patterns are there for a storm? That's in you know, a gazillions, right? I can't really put my hands on every single possible weather pattern or every single <coughs> possible uh, go, you know, sequence of play. But sentences, I may be able to do that with a little bit of structure. I mean, it is true that there might be too many if you think of all possible words, but if you think of what people write, there's a natural there's a, there's a natural structure of words. Once you say say two or three words, the next one is not any possible word in the language. So maybe they're not that many. Um, that approach in general is called a power set. When I take any object I have, whether it's a graph or a sequence of a web page, and I make a static object out of it, and I can use supervised learning with power set. The problem is if I do that, I have to think of how many objects are in that power set. Because there's two problems. One, they could be too many. And two, even if I can handle many objects, I have a big computer, maybe I don't have enough data to learn, right? I mean, for supervised learning, I need previous data. So if I have, you know, 300 billion weather patterns possible, but I only have data for, you know, 100,000 of them, even if my computer can handle 300 billion weather patterns, like it has a big CPU, I won't have any previous data for all these other weather patterns because I haven't seen them. All right. I'm going to add here graph data. Uh, 
uh, graph is just a, a particular case. In general, we have a different structure that's not static. So, you know, if you're Facebook or Google, you have a very specific graph that you have to deal with. Group, uh, Facebook and Google are very different graphs to each other, but they, they both companies have massive graph problems. So how do you predict things based on the structure that my objects could be web pages or people in Facebook case, but my information, how I handle these objects, the people, is not just the person or not just the web page. That would be the static object. Instead, I have to take to, to manage the relationship between the objects that are not up to me to define as in similarity. Like if two images or two people are the same, that's up to me, the machine learning person to define. Facebook <coughs> comes with a graph, right? It tells you who's friends with who. And Google comes with a graph, which is what? In Google, how do we get a graph? Page rank. No, no, that's an algorithm. Links. Crawling. Links. Yeah. Links are the connections that come, <coughs> the graphs comes with, right? It's not up to Google to, dis to define those links. The graphs comes with it. Same thing like Facebook. It's not up to Facebook to define who is friends with who. That's already given. So now I have a graph of objects, could be directed or undirected. And it's not just the object itself. The object might be static, might be a person, might be a web page, might be something that I have information for. <coughs> but there's this other information, who's friends with who, or who implies who, or who links to who, or maybe there's some other connections in different graphs. That's a different kind of machine learning. I have to learn from the structure of the links, not just from <coughs> the static objects. So I think that's plenty, not just for a term. I think that that could take two years easily. So we don't have to do all of it. But that's kind of what machine learning is, right? Uh, our main job is here. That's what we're going to do. Because that makes sense when you start machine learning to deal with that first and then do other things. We'll see how far we get into these other things. We're going to talk a little bit about this. We used to do more of this, now we do less, because there's so many other courses that do unsupervised learning. If you take data mining, for example, that's mostly unsupervised and clustering methods, so it doesn't make sense to repeat all that. Uh, so a lot of data classes, so we do this, we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, then we have the other side of things, which I talked earlier, theory versus practice, because I treat this as a first course of machine learning, it will be more practical, more hands-on, more data-oriented than theoretical. Theory makes a lot of sense in machine learning. Now machine, theoretical machine learning is a subfield of mathematics, it used to be a subfield of computer science, but the people who do machine learning theory are now mathematicians full-blown, like they are part of the math department. It became too, math of machine learning is too, complement, too complicated for people which are not mathematicians to do it. You got to be an actual mathematician. Uh, but we're going to do a little bit of it. Uh, my recommendation, which is why I'm doing the course this way, is to do the practical side first, understand the data and the basic algorithms before you try to solve mathematical problems about this. So I have some slides here, which I'm going to project a little bit. Let me talk first about how things might look like, like as a, as a pipeline. So I have raw data. <laughs> From raw data, I have to get ML data. That is what I was saying before, we need to, raw data might be movies or songs or images, but we need to get those into a format that computers do understand. Right? So say I have uh, with labels here. From here, I'm gonna have a ML algorithm. And 
this will give me a data model. That part is the training part. I get my data, I make it available for computers, I use a particular machine learning algorithm, say regression or naive base, to learn the patterns of the data. Now, what, this data model is a mathematical object. It's something specified with numbers and coefficients and so on and so forth. Right? It's not a human opinion, like a doctor might look at the patient and say, you know, I think this person is sick. That's not that. This is a very strict mathematical model. So now, if I take that model and apply it to new data, so I have some other raw data. Say this is training. Training. This is testing or new. I have to apply the same procedure here to get ML data. Obviously, I have no labels for this, but I can apply, I can use my model to classify this. So, this is the testing part. When I get my new patient or my new image, I transform it into the same kind of format that my algorithm can understand. And I use my model here, this mathematical object, to say, okay, can you predict if this patient has uh, diabetes or not? Can you predict if this image is a tiger? Can you predict if this email is a spam? And then once I make these predictions, so this is predicted labels, I typically use a procedure to evaluate. Say, I want to know how correct my, how, how, how many things you got right. I want to know, you know, I have the test data, I use my model, how do I know how many things you got right? What do I need to evaluate? Labels. I need the true label. So that can't be really a new patient, right? If a new patient comes in the door and my algorithm says, this guy is sick, I need to know if it's really sick. So I need to ask a human, a doctor, hey, my algorithm said this person is sick. Is it actually sick? Is my algorithm correct? Or is it not sick? And then my algorithm was wrong, right? So I need to evaluate this with true uh, test labels. Sometimes we call this ground truth. So in here I get a I get a performance. I get some sort of number how correct my algorithm was. Was was correct 60% of the time, for example. There are many evaluations measures, so I should point that. It's not just the simple one is how often my algorithm was correct. It would be 60%, 70% of the time. But there are at least 10 measures that besides ranking, uh, if it's incorrect, how close to being correct was, right? It may be incorrect by a little bit or incorrect by a lot. Uh, if I have multiple labels, like a patient has three diseases, maybe I get two of them correct in this one. That's incorrect as a set, but I got two at least correct out of three, right? Maybe I can do some ranking. That's another thing that we have to worry about here, ranking. It's not very different than supervised learning, but the task is not to predict a category or a number. It's rather to say, between those three songs, what's the order the user wants to listen to? or between those 10, 20 pages, which the, are the five that are most relevant. There's no number or category to predict by rather a ranking 
in a set of you know few things, which ones should go to the top. Is that comparable to the structure of data? Uh, graphs could be uh, ranking can be a particular case of graphs. But graphs could be much more complicated than a ranking. I mean, I can have a cycles in here. I can think of a web graph. Web graph helps Google rank. Page rank is an algorithm to rank web pages, right? Uh, but you can do a lot more with graphs in terms of predictions than just ranking. So I, I think ranking is a very interesting problem. And for a while, about the last 10 years or so, it was very hot machine learning research how to rank things. Learning to rank was a big, big deal. Now it's kind of settled about some other things. And lately, I think the research has moved into other things. But these were very recently open problems that people at conferences were talking about a lot, how to rank things. So there were entire algorithms adapted from the supervised world, like predict a number, like a salary, or predict a category of a document into how to actually rank this. A lot of search engines pass through a phase. Certainly, uh, Google, Bing, uh, uh, those two pass through a phase where they try to do the ranking of web pages based on machine learning algorithms. Literally, they had those trained models. And every time you ask a query, the main job that behind the scenes was happening was, was was a machine learning algorithm trying to rank web pages. It's still happening to some degree. Uh, but as a parenthesis, do you guys know how Google was the main criteria for ranking things now for Google? There's many criteria, but the main one is not machine learning anymore. Anyway. Right, right, that, that's the objective. <coughs> but how do they decide, given a query, what documents Ad revenue comes after the ranking, right? They rank the web pages for you in the order that they think they're useful for the user. Then depending on what's on those web pages, they decide what ads to place. But the, the, the ranking is still based on what you ask, right, the query. So instead of trying a machine learning algorithm as the main criteria for ranking, how do they rank things now? Most of the time. So it used to be based on content first. If you guys remember, you're too young, Alta Vista, before Google, they look at the page and they try to match your keywords from the query with what's in the page. Then page, Google came along and invented these ranking algorithms like PageRank and other things, and eventually moved to machine learning, where a learning algorithm was trying to say, given the top of 1,000 pages from other criteria like content, how do you rank those? And lately, since they have so many users, so much data, they do what? Hold on. Yes. Is it um, the site with the most links to it? Something like That's that? based on page rank, right? Oh, okay. Page rank says if you have a lot of links for good pages, you must be good. Too. Yeah. What they learn lately, or not lately, say in the last ten years? Relevance, like uh, how relevant the uh, result would be. Consider the other what other people search and what they consider relevant. How do they know what people consider relevant? I mean, like the clicks. Right. It turns out the easiest way for Google to do business is to ignore the pages. Because the query you asked, a million people asked before you. And they already click on the documents that are good for that query. So Google doesn't have to read those documents. They just know, hey, you asked that query? Somebody asked that query before. And everybody who has that query, click on this link, must be good. I don't have to read that document, because other people did it for me. It, uh, you guys see, see what I'm saying here? Where else is this happening, this phenomenon? Shopping. Shopping, right? Amazon doesn't have to judge how good a uh, hammer or a diaper or whatever you buy is. Other people did that for you, right? They bought a bunch of things, they ranked them, and if they say it's good, Amazon say, you know, these other people say it's good, maybe it's good, right? We don't have to look at it and say it's actually good. So that means it's a recommendation system based on data objects. Right. We can add that in here. Seven, recommendation. I think it's called collaborative filtering. So 
shopping, obviously that happens with the reviews. Where else this happens? Movies, Movies right? People with, you know, now, now there's so many streaming platforms. So you open the TV, there's like hundreds of things you can watch. You look at those reviews. You better go by the reviews than by trying to judge from the preview or from the description of the movie. Books? Where does uh, ranking and recommendation differ exactly? So ranking is a much, it's, it's like supervised. It's, uh, it, it, what it does, what we're gonna get there, instead of having a regression loss, regression or, or, or a supervised loss, it's trying to match the predicting label with the true label. So we do that with a certain mathematical loss. In ranking, we have to use a ranking loss. <coughs> We're not trying to match an actual number, like the salaries of people might be in the hundreds of thousands. We're not trying to match the salaries. We're trying to match the ranking of the salaries. So if we get the same ranking, that's great. We don't need exact values, right? But it's still a supervised algorithm. Recommendation system goes by other people liked it, therefore you probably gonna like it too. What's the difficulty? In, uh, what's the easy part of collaborative filtering first? Oh, yes. Question? Yeah, I, I was actually, you might what you want to get to, but um, our collaborative filter deals with new items. Right. What if there's a new thing that in a Google search is a better response, but no one's had a chance to look at it yet? How does it deal with that? That's a great question conceptually. As in, if a new thing happens, and you are the first one to ask, right? Google might be like, whoa, that's a new thing now, right? Amazon might be like, whoa, that's a new product, you know, I don't have any reviews for it, a new movie, nobody has seen it, right? So conceptually, that's a great question. At the minimum, all these machines and algorithms need a flag. Hey, it's a new thing, don't apply the old stuff. But in practice, is that gonna really affect how often a person ask one thing for the first time. You are Google now. How many people put that first query when something just happened? No. So if, if a million people ask the same question, only the first 10 or 20 or 50 of those million have that property, right? I haven't seen this before. Well, it's more, uh, not the questionnaire, but the, uh, the website, if there's a new uh, a new website is posted that says that actually has the ideal response to some existing query, but if no one's had a chance to, the, the collaborative filtering has a, no one's had a chance to click on it yet, then it's going to be obviously very low ranked, the collaborative filtering, even though it might be objectively a better response to this true. established query. True, true, true. But that only happens for the first few people. Once somebody clicks on it, Right? It doesn't happen anymore. Your question is, how do you get people to click on it to start? Right. How does it show up initially if Google mostly used it? So there's still, on, before we do machine learning or we do recommendations, Google would still be based on content, would produce candidates based on content. So they would still match your query words with the text in the web page. Now, for Google, there's an additional wrinkle there. They have to update their index to see that page. So his question might be, okay, even if Google gets to the content of the page by matching my words with those words, Virgil is written in the page, right? Google can update the indexes once a day or once every two days before they update the index. That page won't even be visible to anybody. So in that sense, Google has to treat some web pages like you know monitoring, uh, monitoring some event that's going on, terrorist attack, right? It can't wait to update the index two days later because by then it's over. So things like that, they have to monitor more or less manually. If something happened, pay attention to it. Uh, for most web pages, this is not an issue, right? Because if, if, it's, if it updates you know, within a day or so, that's okay. But for live events, like typically an emergency sort of thing, uh, both news and, and uh, aggregators like Google have some other hooks that are going on live immediately. Like they detect some event has happened and then they assign a person, you gotta manage this event. You know, at least pop up the results higher. When, when people ask questions about this, define a list of keywords, make sure the following web pages show up. Okay, but, but for us, the most important thing is, assuming the page is available, 
we need some content related issue with a movie or a web page to make sure it's visible first. So that all happens anyway before we do ranking or machine learning. Uh, so we have this recommendation, recommendation system. What's the good part about recommending things? People are willing to write reviews. We, we don't have to pay people to write reviews, right? They just do it. Imagine what Amazon would do if people wouldn't write, I, I never wrote any review in my life, zero. I'm a terrible customer because I use other people's reviews but Amazon or other people have no benefit from me because I never say I like that thing or not, right? But the good thing about this is for most movies and products and whatever else, web pages, people click on them, all right? And we, Google doesn't have to worry that people won't click on their pages. They're just gonna happen. So that's the good part. The bad part is you need a lot of data for this. If you are Google or Amazon or Facebook, that's great because you have hundreds of millions clicking on your stuff or they're doing stuff every day. But if you are not one of these big guys, and you can see that minor players, they struggling, they copy reviews from somewhere else. You see the same review and the same rating that you see in other parts because how can they get those reviews to work, right? So the good part here is that people do it. We don't have to pay extra. The bad part is, if you are not a big player, you're going to struggle having this feedback. All right. Um, so, before I connect my projector here, um, we're going to want to transform these objects into uh, numerical vectors. That is this ML data. So we're going to take uh, any one of these things, say a patient. Let's call the patient X or, or XI, the i patient. And we're going to say that's got to be XI1, XI2, XI3, XI. Say D. Uh, those are not exponents, like power exponents. They're just indices. So this is one patient that has those, uh, we're going to call those features or attributes. <coughs> and they typically numerical, even if they're non numerical, we're going to try to make them numerical. If one of these attributes is, for example, some category, we can have that category. 0, 1, or something like that. So we're going to try to make this numerical. So these are numerical values. This one here is a feature value, which is numerical. So my training data might look like this. I have x1, x2, x3, up to xn. Those are my data points. And then I have here x11, one, one, x12, one, x1d, one, x21, x22, x2d, up to xn1, xn2, xn. Every patient in this case has been written with D numerical features. We call this a feature matrix. Now, recently, most machine learning, especially in industry, is concerned with this. There's very little research, or much less than before, into the actual algorithm here. With the, the world, the, the research world has been concerned for the last 40 years or so with what's the best algorithm to learn from data, how do we create this model. So people have developed things like perceptron, neural networks, support vector machines, regressions, uh, decision trees, you name it, many fancy algorithms, <coughs> very, very 
uh, theoretically grounded, all kinds of proofs and uh, complicated about how do I take the data and learn the model. That's an algorithm. That's going to be the focus on this course. CS6140. What are the methods that you take data into a model? So the first one we're going to start talking about on Thursday are decision trees. Decision trees is one of the subjects. But recently, in the last five years or so, in industry, nobody cares too much about new algorithms. It's kind of considered a done deal. I, people believe it's not possible to improve significantly on the algorithms side. I mean, if, you're, if you are a health company and you do predictions on, on billing codes for patients, if you get with the current algorithms 60% or 70% accuracy, it is believed that you could improve that 70 to 72 by hiring a floor of machine learning scientists. That's what Google has, entire floors of machine learning people, right? But you're gonna improve from 70 to 72. The real improvements can come from better features. So most people in industry, especially if you take this class and no other class and you go in the, in the, in the, in the industry to work with data and apply machine learning, the, the improvements you can make, the contribution you can make is much more likely to be in data representation, finding features that they were not extracted from data or not, not paid attention to, then you are likely to improve the algorithm significantly. Again, most people believe the current algorithms do the best they can with data. It's not easy to improve this. There are some issues there still, open problems. Things like, for example, some algorithms require not just a prediction, but a confidence. So it's not enough to say, I predict this patient has diabetes. I predict this uh, email to be spam. For this to be useful in many scenarios, I need to attach a probability <coughs> confidence to it. The probability of this patient having diabetes is 87%. The probability of this email being a spam is 65%. Okay? So it's different, right, to say a spam, an email is a spam with probability 99% versus 52%. Clearly, those are different predictions, even though if I'm to make a black and white prediction, I'm going to say in both cases that's a spam or the patient has diabetes. It's one thing to say I'm 99.9 .9 sure this person has diabetes and quite another thing to say, I don't know. I think he might have diabetes, but it's like a gray area, right? Can you think of some examples where this is critical? So I have a machine learning system. I'm doing predictions. I'm at supervised learning. Where do I need this confidence to make something out of it? Context in NLP, like you given different scenarios, so it gives a confidence score for which scenario is better. For each scenario, it gives a confidence score of what it thinks is. Right, but those scores don't have to be probabilities, right? I just pick the highest score and I, I do that one thing, right? Yeah. In, in some cases, just knowing which one is the most likely prediction. So, Take another example of three patients. They may have three, either this or that disease or that disease. I don't need confidence to say which one I think is more likely. I get those scores and I say predict the highest one. But where do I actually need confidence in a probability sense? Fraud detection. Hmm? Fraud detection. Fraud detection in banking. Fraud. Fraud detection. So if I, if I have, say, I detected a fraud, right? We didn't even put that example here. That's a great example, right? credit card, right? Sometimes your credit card doesn't work, right? And you say, call the bank because uh, I'm in Australia and in Australia, uh, they, they detect this an anomaly, right? I'm usually not in Australia, now I am, so I use my card, they block it, I have to call, right? The blocking, you're saying, has a confidence rate. So for every transaction, now banks have uh, this probability of fraud, right? And what you're saying is, so where do I set that threshold? Right? He's saying, I look at the transactions, they have a confidence into the fraud possibility. Do I really need them to be probabilities? As in, suppose those scores, the fraud detections, are not probabilities. They integers from 0 to 100. Isn't it enough to have integers and put a threshold at, say, 
86 or something and say, okay, I mean, even if they're not probabilities, I'm only going to block cuts that have scores higher than a threshold. So I I'm asking you, I'm making this question difficult now because you guys are getting close, right? <coughs> Where do I need a probability as opposed to a score? Most of these algorithms will produce a score, like naive base will produce a score, support the machines will produce a score, neural numbers will produce a score. But those scores are not probabilities. They're going to give you a score of that being a fraud, 237.85, right? And I, those scores are random numbers. They, I can only count on their order. The higher the score is, the more likely is that's an actual fraud. Yes. Uh, face ID, mm -hmm. you have to be very confident if you are uh, training a face ID system. Like, right, like but is it, is it, do we have to be a probability? Can very confident be a number that's not a probability, like a very high number? Again, I'm making this question hard. I think it's easier to evaluate your model. You can see if it's wrong. If it's wrong, almost everyone is very confident. You can trust those more. Okay, that's closer. I wouldn't go as far as combining things, but I like the evaluation idea. I like this course to be meaningful somehow. I can, in terms of being confident, I can say high scores indicate confidence, right? Face ID or bank fraud, whatever. If it's more than 10,000, I'm pretty confident it's correct. If it's below 10,000, I don't know, and if it's below 5,000, I declare it like a uh, why this course, while good for ranking good versus not good, or confident versus not confident, open the phone versus not open the phone, block the card, not block the card. That's okay, they don't have to be probabilities, but sometimes I need them to be probabilities. Yes? Uh, if you have probabilities, you can like define error rates and control error rates. So if you make like thousands of predictions, you can like specify like, um, like false discovery rates. Right. That's as close as him with the evaluation. Are you talking about the probability of making a move, like in a game? I would like the scores that come out for diabetes or for spam or fraud detection to actually be probabilities that I can count on. If that number is 70%, I need that 70% to mean something, not to be just a high or low score. Because if it's just a high score, it could be 7,000 or 70,000. I don't need it to interpret. But why it be useful? to interpret as a probability, yes. Uh, something like object recognition. Let's say uh, you're trying to recognize an object. I can say there's a 60% probability that this is, this is a pen, and 10% uh, probability that this is a pen, something like that. Right, so what do I do with that probability? If it's correct, if it's like calibrated, like it's true 60%, why is it useful? Because if I try to to classify, to predict, right? I, I don't need it to be an actual probability. I say whatever the highest score is, whether it's a probability or not, I predict it as a pen. When a, when a data item has multiple labels associated with it, that time you can say, for example, a news article, it can talk about sports and other stuff as well. So you want to be confident about how much you want to be how much percent is the article talking about sports and stuff. So you can say this article is categorized into sports categories with this much. Right. So we are close. But I, I am your hint, the evaluation thing is the closest thing. Yes. Can you just present your data to a client? Can you give them a number they can understand as opposed to just summarizing number? Right. That's evaluation but not mathematical. The person needs to know. Yes. Is it when you're looking for like a confidence interval and you want to be able to define like exactly. Right, right. That's, I don't want to go that far today. Okay. If, if I want to make an estimate, sometimes in statistics, estimators come with variance that defines confidence intervals. So it's going to say, I believe it's that value, the predictions, I predict in your salary. Your salary is 150,000 plus minus how, how, how much error do I allow in there, right? Uh, uh, I want to have a high confidence that means a, a small interval of variability. But that's not what I want to go with this discussion. Um, we're talking about comparing different algorithms. So if, if we have, if one algorithm um, uh, gives you a, a high probability of, of recognizing diabetes or whatever, but the other one doesn't. That's a great point. If those numbers are just high or low, 
I could make classification based on one algorithm. But if I'm to compare a support vector machine with a naive base, now I can do accuracy by thresholding those numbers, but I can't tell how, how well those numbers work unless all the numbers are on the same scale. That doesn't have to be probability though, right? I mean, it has to be a scale, a universal scale, comparable, but doesn't have to be that probability scale. Let me bring up the point, which is, if my algorithm says the confidence of diabetes for this patient is 70%, and I go ahead with that prediction of 70%, I want to be correct 70% of the time. So I have a million patients, right? I classify all of them. Diabetes, 10%, 15%, 20%, 60%, 80%, 90%. For every patient, I have a, a confidence or a score. Of course, the high scores are the ones that are likely to have diabetes, and the low scores are the ones that are likely to not have diabetes. So by picking a threshold, say I'm picking my threshold somewhere in the score, I say, I'm gonna predict these ones have diabetes, these ones do not. That's fine for predictions. What it helps to have actual probabilities, like real probabilities, is to say, out of all the patients, I may have 10,000 patients, all about 70% chance of diabetes, right? So I do these 10,000 patients, and I tell my customer, you know, my client, hey, those 10,000 people are at 70% diabetes chance. I would like the reality to be that 7,000 out of 10,000 of them have diabetes. I, I think 70% of those people who I marked with 70% are the ones who have diabetes. That way, the hospital can make some decisions, right? That well, it's not just a prediction, hey, 10,000 people would have diabetes. That well, you know, I may be wrong. So obviously when I say 70%, I expect to be correct about some of them and incorrect about others, right? Because I'm not saying 100%, I'm saying 70%, which means I'm expecting to be incorrect. For a hospital, they need to take those 10,000 people and make a planning that about 7,000 of them have diabetes. They don't know which ones, but they would know to plan for 7,000, not for 8,000, not for 3,000. Same in tourism, right? When you know people go to hotels in the Christmas break, they need to make some planning. It's essential to get those numbers estimated right. Stock market, the same thing, or real estate, right? Uh, I work consulting for data for various companies, and one of them is uh, Partners Healthcare. Uh, they have the following problem. They want to predict diagnosis codes. So what happens, a patient walks in, and uh, they have all kinds of tests and the, the regular <coughs> hospital thing, and they do a procedure sometimes, a surgery, for example, or whatever it is. And it comes a time when the hospital has to send a bill to the insurance company. In the United States and most of the Western world, most of the time insurance companies pay, not the patients from their pocket. By the way, that's why it's so expensive healthcare, because it's not the patients that pay, but the insurance company. So what happens is they have to spend a great deal of effort into looking at the doctor record, because doctors are required to write down or to dictate what they did, and put those codes in. They won't get any money by saying this guy had a surgery or had diabetes. They have to put procedural codes and diagnosis codes to send to the insurance company. Those codes are standardized by the US government. So for every code, you get a certain amount of money. You have to put the right codes in there, or the insurance won't pay, or even worse, will sue you. Because hey, you're cheating, you're trying to get more money, right? You guys understand how this goes? I'm the hospital, people come in, I do whatever I do with the patients, but at the very end, to get my money, I have to send for each patient the codes. There are 80,000 diagnosis codes in the book. It turns out the hospital, this is such a difficult task. The hospitals hire armies of coders. This is a profession now. People who look at medical records, they're not doctors. They look at the record and what happened. And based on that record, they assign the diagnosis and procedural codes to send to the insurance company. Now, you can imagine those coders, they, they have to be educated into the medical domain. It's not like me, I can look at the doctor note and decide the code. I have no clue what code applies, right? I mean, it's not like they have to be a doctor, but they have to understand what codes applies to what procedure. 
and more complicated what codes goes together because it's not just one code. A patient might have three diagnosis codes and two procedures, right? So I have to take those medical records for each patient, transform them into the billing codes, and send the billings to the insurance company. So here's where this comes into play big time. I have an algorithm, that's what I do for consulting, with many other smart people, smarter than me, that takes the medical record and predicts a bunch of codes. Now, we not right all the time. In fact, most of the time, it's very hard to get the exact set of codes right. There are like five <coughs> diagnosis codes and three procedural codes. You're not gonna get all eight of them right. But we produce a list of 20 codes that we think are very likely to apply. A human might still have to look at that list and select <coughs> from a list of 20 which ones are the actual correct codes. It's much easier to select from a list of 20 than from a list of 80,000. And we assign probabilities for these codes. So if we say for a code 99.9%, .9%, probably the human won't look at that. Because 99.9% .9 means we are correctly right most of the time. But if we assign 60% chance, then that's the code a human would actually look at and say, hey, the algorithm is not sure. Let me look at it. So we can reduce the, the coder's job by at least two-thirds of the effort by producing those top 20 codes with probabilities. They can only look at the ones that have about 50, 60 probability, and the ones that are high or low just assign automatically, saving a great deal of money. Of course, it's the health system that's very bureaucratic that allows us to make money that way. It could be simplified. But given what it is, confidence <coughs> is essential for the decision makers to say, hey, if it's 98% or higher, let it go to the insurance company. We won't get sued for that. We're probably going to pay. And if it's 85% or lower, look at it between 75 and 85%. And if it's below 70%, don't assign it at all. Don't spend it. How do you ensure that the percentages that you're outputting are actually consistent with the reality? Right, that's my, my point. That's an open problem in machine learning. Doing that is called calibration. There's active research into it. So while, while the algorithms themselves, again, very few people, apart from few academic studies, still algorithms for supervised classification, how do we ensure these scores have certain properties? One property, which we just talked about, is calibrated correctly. Another property might be some sort of ranking or scale or comparison between algorithms have been brought up in here. Um, and there's some other consistency issues. If, if I'm Google, I'm going to use machine learning algorithms with 700 features, and all those features are different criteria, I need to, for example, normalize them. How do you do those things? So normalization, calibration, are still open problems for various tasks. Okay, so back to this here. We have this feature matrix. Uh, that's how my data is gonna look like. Now in the beginning, homework one, you're going to be given a matrix like this. So instead of getting raw data, which might be images or text, you're going to get a matrix like that that's already done. Now you can try manually to match each number with, with the raw data. So some of these data sets, we don't even have the raw data because the public data sets put together a long time ago. We don't have the emails anymore, but we do have the extracted features. So the basic stuff is to Run, a run an algorithm, get a model, test on your data, and then uh, evaluate the model. We need few pieces. So we need the feature matrices. We're going to have two of them, right? Training and testing. Sometimes we don't have two of them. We get a one gigantic feature matrix, so we chop off the test set. Right? If I, if I have only one, I may say, hey, 20% of it is test, and 80% of it is training. That's a very typical split. Because in practice, you have a lot more training data than what you test on. So if you only get in one feature matrix, you may, in order to run an algorithm on it, you may say, okay, I'm taking four fifths of it for the training purposes. And we might even get a slide here. Maybe sometimes for validation. I can't get into that today, but some algorithms require training and validation different sets. So 
So it's, you're going to see that some algorithms, uh, by regression, basic vanilla regression only requires a train set. But the regularized regression requires a validation set. Okay. So we'll get to that at some point. Uh, some data sets come with a test separated already. So you don't have to worry about the split. It's clearly training versus testing. The train on the train data is testing. We're going to need some basic algorithms. The first one we study next time, decision trees. Uh, we got, so we have what part? We have the data, we have the algorithms. The model is decided by the algorithm. If it's a decision tree algorithm, what do you think it's going to produce? It's going to produce a decision tree, right? Um, and then we're going to predict. We use the tree on the test data. We're going to predict labels. If we have emails, for example, we're going to assign, I think that's spam, that's not spam, that's spam, that's not spam. We're not worried about calibration right now, as in what we just discussed be sure that the scores match reality. But then we're going to need to evaluate. So to do homework one, we're going to need a basic uh, at least counting to say how many of these I got correct. That's something I, I don't think I need to explain. We just look at them and we compare the predicted label with the test label and we say how many times that was correct. But there's other measures than this. In particular, imagine housing prices. Suppose my data are houses, and I have two houses. And the label is the price. The features might be location, number of bedrooms, square feet, year of you know, building the house, uh, color, whatever, uh, bathrooms, whatever people is looking in the house. Label might be the price, right? Does it make sense to measure my algorithm for getting the price exact to say, OK, I have 10,000 houses. I predict the price for all of them. I have the price in US dollars. I take that price. I compare with the true price to see if my prediction is correct or not, right? Does it make sense to say, if I get exactly the true price, it's good. And if i off, it's bad? That makes sense for diabetes, right? Diabetes, if I say diabetes and it has it, I'm correct. If I say no, it doesn't have it, I'm correct. The other way, it's not for a category. But for house pricing, that doesn't make sense to, to judge if you got the exact dollar, you're correct. You might say, OK, well, if you are within, say, 10% of the correct price, then you're correct, right? But then, oh, we're already making some assumption. I mean, a realtor or a, a guy looking for a house may not feel like 10% is correct. Who knows? I mean, on the other side, maybe 20% is correct, right? How do I know how to evaluate a house price prediction that's a quantity, right? Right, so I need a different metric than exact versus not exact. I need a metric that says how far away are you for the correct price. The farther you are, the lower your performance is, right? The closer you are. You know, you, we don't want to impose 10% or 20% arbitrarily. We want to say, hey, the closer you are to the price, the better you get. So we need, obviously, some measure here to do that. Like, loss, like square loss, right? That's the one you have in mind. There's all kinds of losses here that evaluate depending on what the problem is. So let me see if I can connect this thing here. You guys are going to have to uh, write the. Uh, Teach 
ML course, HTML index. So a few things you should do right away. There's some announcements here about logistic class, office hours, PAs, so on and so forth. We're going to meet those. The first PAs office hours will be on Thursday. Not today, not tomorrow, but on Thursday. The rooms are in Ryder Hall. It will be in the evening. If people can't make any evening, we'll make some accommodation for mornings or Saturdays. Uh, here's a schedule for the first four weeks or so. So this is organized by weeks. We talk about the intro slides now. And uh, you click on here on slides and you get to see the slides. That's kind of what we talked about. Uh, the video will be this picture. If you click on this picture, you get that video. Not yet. You have to put it online. Okay. Uh, here will be some recapping and reading. There's no official textbook. What I want you guys to read will be organizing notes. So if you see notes, decision trees, those are notes that I want you guys to read, or I'll put a PDF for a link. There's two recommended textbooks, but not mandatory. And here on the side, there's an assignment. I'm still working on this assignment, so you don't have to start today, because I'm going to edit some things in it. The first four problems are programming problems, and there are three problems that are on paper problems. Um, we're going to talk more about this, but it's available. You can take a look at it. Uh, typically, it gives you the data sets here at the top. So it's spam based. You click on it, and uh, you get some data set that you can download. It's already in a feature matrix format, so you don't have to worry about extracting features from emails. Um, so what you have to do in terms of logistics? Uh, this is us. It's me, the TAs, where helping sessions gonna happen. This is the Piazza Forum that we're gonna have, so this is all the questions, and uh, I think you need to enroll on this. That's not the correct one, so. <coughs> This is where announcement is going to happen. Uh, homework one is posted, is what I show you. You got to set up Piazza, you got to definitely own Piazza. The submissions will happen through a service called Dropbox. I think most of you are familiar with it. You have to create a folder like CS6140, CS first name, last name, and share that folder in an editable form with this email address. We won't use that for grading, just for archiving purposes. Only if we think there's a problem, we're going to look at that code. You get a grade by visiting the PA office hours, and you get a grade on the spot. But if we think there's a problem, or we can't find your assignment, or we feel like we copy-pasted the code from somewhere else, we need a hard you know, uh, evidence for it. So you are required to put your submission code, whatever you, you is required for the homework, in that folder. But don't put data, please. Data put it somewhere else on your hard drive. Everything you download or you need to download, uh, like big data put it somewhere else. But we're going to ask you for any report or code to be that your drop of folder. People usually organize it by homework. So there'll be 6140 Virgil Pablo, that's my folder. Homework one in it, homework two, or other things. So TA will know where to go with for your uh, code. So you should set up this Dropbox. Uh, if you don't have a Dropbox account, it's free for two gigabytes, and you won't need more than two gigabytes for this class. Especially if data doesn't go in the Dropbox folder. You, know, you only need code. And share it with this email address so we can have access to it. There's also um, one more thing. There is some form that I need from you. It's, um, I need you guys to fill up this. I know you did it on the registrar and put it in that Dropbox folder so we know who's who. It's a simple text file. You just put your name, your email address. Please use one email address with us, not multiple ones. And whether you are a master, PhD, undergraduate, so on and so forth, and this is a key for the grades. It will take two minutes. 
the text file, you place it in that folder, that's it. Um, classes are Tuesday, Thursdays, you guys already know that. Back to this page here. These are all TAs, Kitchen Kin is a PhD student. Bingy will help a little bit, the guy who came with the camera. Uh, if we get stuck, he's a world class expert on machine learning. I have two PhD students, three with Kitchen, that could help us with problems if you get stuck during the film. They'll visit office hours every once in a while to see how we're doing. Um, and I plan for those to be in the evening, 6 to 8 or 6 to 9. If you can make any evening, you don't have to come to all of this hours. Just come when you have questions or you want to show your code. If you can make any single evening, you'll have to make a different accommodation. Right. Homework one due in two weeks. Yes? Are you guys doing the full I'll have to edit the homework mark as well. Yes, the same homework, but for undergraduate students will have a mark. Graduate or Just it's an independent study, not. Okay. 